True. And now let's move on to comparing the latest releases, the XH1 with the Sony A7R 3 I think first it's worth mentioning though that the A7R 3 again is the most expensive compared to the A7 III. So I think the A7 III is probably a more comparable camera to compare it to, but because we don't have that, I think you know the features are, are more or less on par. So yeah. a closer match would be the A7 III. That is true. So here we have the XH1 and I bought this camera because I wanted to do more videography and when it came to Fujifilm they hit the X-T2 and it did good video but it was really lacking in some other features like primarily the image stabilization was the huge win here and also log so Fujifilm was looking at the market and they realized what they don't offer is what is a good mirrorless similar to some of the Sony offers the A7S2 or something like that yeah, they said that too. And also the GH5 by Panasonic, very, very strong video camera. So Fujifilm came out with this, and I bought it right away. I pre ordered it the minute it was announced. And we can go ahead and compare these two, and you yourself bought this Sony. Yeah, so I bought the Sony A7R3, and again, I bought it with the intention of doing more video with it, which again is why I switched to Canon in the first place, but I did have it on the back of my mind that I'd probably probably use it for photos as well, and again, I'm taking advantage of that 42 megapixel uh, sensor there, and doing a lot of more architecture and landscape photography with it. But again, I think a more comparable um, camera model to, to compare it to would be the a7 III, or by the time, maybe at some point, the a7S III will come out. But that, again, is part of the frustration with Sony. Yeah, so maybe I would have gone for a different camera, but given the release cycle, this was the best camera for me at the time, so that's what I have. Um, as far as the comparison goes, um, first thing is the Sony has a full frame sensor. Yeah, it's well, the this is a crop. and. Even though that is so, the Sony is smaller. They're, they're actually around equally heavy, but the Sony is smaller. So if you wanted compact size and that's what you like, um, the Sony is a win there. They pack more technology into smaller space. Um, but for me, the ergonomics on this X-H1 are better because I can really comfortably hold it like this. And I have enough space here and the grip feels good. But if I try to pick that up, um, my fingers immediately run against the lens and it's actually pretty uncomfortable so this would really get on my nerves if I'm doing a photo shoot so I find this to be too small for my hands personally well why don't you try my little crop Sony <laughs> like this one's this one's too small for me and I have small hands yeah I have tried using so, that and yeah. it feels like a toy it's, camera and I really cannot small. use it it's at actually, all it's a great camera the image quality on that and the video quality is fantastic but you're right if you want ergonomics like yeah. even for someone with small hands like that's a small camera <laughs> yeah, yeah, so that always felt like a toy camera to me and I get lost in the menu. So that's the other thing. I personally like this style of controls a lot better and it makes me a Fuji customer because I really love what they give me for, for that. And you yourself aren't a big fan of that, so yeah. you're happy with the Sony's version of controls yeah, in that yeah. case. Yeah, I, and again, because I can more or less customize it to be um, pretty close to how I use my DSLRs. So, um, and because I still use my DSLRs and I flip back and forth between them, it's just easier for me to, um, to, yeah, to use two different systems like that. So that, to me, is more of like a preference thing. So it if is, we're going to prefer is. some controls or another. Both of these cameras, when it comes to the build of the body, are very well made. In fact, they're, they feel solid, they feel sturdy. But I do think the Fuji body is more sturdy. The people have taken it to very harsh conditions. It survives at very low temperatures and part of the hype about this camera they reinforce the body with magnesium i think so it is actually more heavy duty heavy duty um i again i'm not gonna i'm not willing to test this theory but supposedly the new a7r3 is also more weather sealed everywhere but the bottom mm. i think they've actually done tests where it was really solid up until the bottom area which is partially why i reinforced it with some gaff tape um that and because I'm always using tripod plates and that's pretty much the first place where you're going to scratch up your camera as you're using it. So yeah, supposedly this is more weather sealed, but again, not, not going to test that. Yeah, meanwhile, the Fuji is for sure weather sealed. Um, people have shot in the rain a lot and with this lens, it, the entire thing becomes weather sealed. So you are not risking normally at anything unless you drop it submerged in water. But that's not what you want to do with the camera like this. But you can shoot in the rain, you don't need to worry if, 
if rain starts in the middle of your photo shoot, you don't have to run and all that. So that's something I like a lot. And for being really picky about the XH1 in particular, yours also has a top LCD, yeah, that is true. which is closer to you know like older DSLRs. I don't have that on my on my A7R3, and I think even you are saying that you know it's not necessarily a benefit. It's I mean, it depends. It gives you like a at a glance, and it's programmable how much battery you have, so you don't get surprised how many I know steals or how much video you can take. Um, it tells you your exposure compensation, but I miss the dial they used to have here. The and exposure now, compensation? Yes, yeah, Sony stole the dial great. from my camera, it seems like. It. Well, Come on, no. It's it had. Anyway, the A7R3 <laughs> has exposure compensation dial, the X-H1 does not. Yeah, which is sense. now a flip on what was the case before. Uh, I miss my dial. I wish they wouldn't have I taken my it. dial. <laughs> so I'm with you on that. I would definitely also prefer exposure compensation, or just some other dial than a, than an LCD that's just telling you right. what your settings are. Both of them have Vibis, the in-body image stabilization, but we tested it and we found out that we like it a lot better on the Fujifilm X-H1. It just is doing more for you, it seems like. Yeah, on the Sony, it's it's known as um, optical steady shot, I think, and or just steady shot, and then. Um, yeah, and obviously, like your lenses can also have you know steady shot or ibis or whatever you want to call oh, it yeah. inside of them too, and that definitely helps. But I think also there's a reason why. Like I actually did some YouTube you know tests just to see other people trying to test out Sony ibis or Sony Sony steady shot, and you don't see a whole lot of examples of that. Yeah. And yeah, when we did our couple of comparisons, like both of us using both cameras, mm -hmm. you know, with our own panning and. You know, our handheld test shots definitely yours come out. Yeah, the, much Fuji, the more Fuji wins that yeah. one. Uh, however, what Fuji does not win, in fact, it degraded. It seems like in version one from even the XT2 is the um, the focus that follows the subject. Um, mm -hmm. The continuous focus is so much superior in the Sony's, and even it was released worse than the previous models of Fuji. But they are trying to fix that with the software release. I think they will be able to, so it was a kind of a problem, especially when you use the 400% um, dynamic range setting on the Fuji. Um, there are, I think, some things that the Fuji has more capability for. For example, if you're shooting video, this thing goes to 200 megabits per second, while the Sony only goes to 100. So mm -hmm. you actually get a higher quality video out of this one, despite the sensor being smaller. Mm -hmm. And again, of all the many Sony lines. I think the a7 III even is slightly more video focused and the a7 S3 whenever that comes out is also going to be more video focused. So again those are probably more comparable on a video right. on a video level. Like Another big thing to talk about is um, Fuji film is famous for its film simulations and it really gets the color amazingly well. Like it's beautiful to be honest. I don't know much about your color profiles on the Sony. I do like the colors coming out of it, but I still am pretty partial to the Sony or the Fuji color. I'm always shooting raw. Like I very rarely shoot JPEG anyway, so I do you know I do a lot of my work in post production. Yeah, and I have gotten into a flow where I let the camera do the initial round, essentially through the film simulations. Where if I know what I'm going for, I will shoot one of the film simulations and. I normally shoot via Velvia because I like vivid colors and I've tried shooting raw with this thing and I didn't try to take it to where I like it and where it takes it on its own with the Velvia profile and it beats me like I don't know how to do color correction as well as Fuji's engineers so I actually am more satisfied shooting JPEGs it's so much faster and I get a better result. Yeah I mean there are some I think um, not quite film simulations but similar on, on the Sony but they're definitely not as well known and, you know, again, I haven't really used them much, so I don't yeah. know. But, I mean, but there's a reason a, for that. You know, yeah, there was yeah. an option on the Sony's, but I would definitely, like, I love your quality of JPEGs that come straight out of camera. Like, you were constantly shooting the same thing, and his are way better at a camera <laughs> than mine. Yeah, quite, quite better. And um, together with that, Fujifilm released um, what they call Cinema Mode or Eterna, and that's based on how you would shoot a motion picture in a way, because they tend to have some subdued colors and you know the, the color sense is particular so they give in this model uh, the eternal film simulation for cinema which is um, a really good base for you to grade later with um, something like DaVinci Resolve or Premiere and again if I shoot log I actually don't see the benefit so much in shooting log because I find myself better off shooting Eterna and using that as a base to grade further. 
and I've even started shooting videos with the other profiles just to try like a Velvia or a Provia and I find them as well fantastic if I'm shooting nature or wildlife uh, I love the Velvia I don't mind that it's so um, contrasted and saturated and if I'm shooting documentary I really do like the Provia so again my grading is taken a lot further simply out of camera than I would have had if I if I was not using a Fuji and then I had to have a monitor, shoot log and then grade a lot. Um, so I'm pretty happy with what you've done here. Maybe one of the challenges though is if we're both using two different cameras and if he's shooting a simula film simulation yeah. and again that's because we're still kind of working out our video editing um, workflow but matching you know my colors to his yeah. is... That yeah, is almost impossible and so it is often the case that we should the same photo shoot or video shoot together and color matching is an issue in this case so I guess that's what log is for and LUTs are for and so on so that's how you would have to do it but that unfortunately means that it, we will not be ending up with the awesome color profiles that Fuji will give you because we cannot make the Sony match them. Yeah and so I guess that's uh, that would be an argument for if you are shooting video in, in particular that you'd it's better to use two of the same brand, especially for Fujifilm, if you want to get things really quick and you know right out of camera and not spend yeah. a whole lot of time in post-production. Right, people have said, and the way videography is going these days, there's so much more demand for video. However, the demand is for social media, and so the expectation isn't so much that you put something on the big screen in, in the cinema. Even though these cameras actually are able to produce a cinema format, they're that good, but um, you would spend your you know, sweet time making the colors amazing if you're putting it on a movie screen. However, if you're making social media stuff, which is most of us, you quickly get that out with the Fujifilm camera. I think this is the whole uh, big thing. But you can truly make uh, movies and together with this camera, Fujifilm released two amazing lenses which cost around $4,000 each. And they can do the nice zoom with maintaining the focus and all these cinematic tricks. So it seems like Fuji is full on going into cinema. So other than that, the features are rather comparable. Both of these camera can do slow motion 120 frames per second in my case, and yours too, right? Yep, same thing. Yeah, so that's five times slow down um, compared to normal. Uh, but in, in both cases, I believe you cannot do 4K that way. Um, phones do, ironically, because phones are actually more powerful computers when you think about the hardware. but. Cameras haven't started shooting 4K slow motion, that's just too much computing. Yeah. One thing that is cool about the Sony though is that in addition to slow motion, it does it's quick fast motion, motion yeah. hyperlapse. That's, that's I don't know what, like, well, there's it's not kind really of a term for almost it. Almost there, like, so it shoots what, um, once a second or something? Well, like? it's called, so on your dial you have a new S and Q setting, which is how you would get to slow motion, but if you go into the settings, you can have it be, you know, 120 frames per second to go slow, but you can also, like, there's faster increments. Yeah, there's a one frame per second, yeah, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, however, you don't have interval, which is what I do. And if you yeah. wanted to make a really nice actual time lapse made of the stills, which I think it beats in quality in the end, you, you don't do that easily with the Sony for some reason right now. So, yeah, so that's something that a lot of Sony shooters, including myself, are not happy with because this little guy, and even I think the A7R2, they came with um, these built-in apps. And so through those built-in apps, you could download just a bunch of, of extensions. And one of them was a time-lapse feature. And that is missing on the A7R3, and I think the A7 III, and yeah. maybe they're just taking them off of all cameras going forward. No one really knows why. And so, you know, your, your S and Q, you know, quick mode setting is a way to sort of get a time lapse. Yeah, but it's not but as flexible. Yeah, it's not quite the same. Yeah. So you still would need to buy a intervalometer and just kind of, you know, fiddle with extra settings just to get time lapses yeah. on this camera, which is a little frustrating. My little camera can do that, so that's another reason why, like, I almost sold this camera, I'm glad I didn't, and one of the reasons was because I can still do time lapse on this. So a lot of times, if I'm shooting two scenes, like, I'll have this, and I'm kind of just walking around and shooting with it, and this is going to be on the tripod doing my time lapse, because I can't quite do it with this camera. But then when you stack it up, neither your quick video mode on that one, nor the time lapse on this one gives you the quality that the time lapse is this thing does. 
Yeah, true. Yeah, it's, it's just spend, quite a quality. I've spent a lot of our time in post production because again, when I'm doing my time lapses, I'm typically shooting raws, which eh, gives mm, me more. It's a lot of the work. Yeah, it gives me more um, control over editing and post processing. But I mean, you know, honestly, that's another reason why you wouldn't want time lapse necessarily on this camera because imagine <laughs> shooting like a time lapse. A hundred gigabytes. In raw with, <laughs> in, oh um, my god! Yeah. Um, does your overheat, because they manage the temperature really well in this camera? Yeah, so that has actually been fixed on this camera. It was definitely an issue on the A6300, and I think that they've actually fixed it on the A6500, but like I film with this constantly and I forget that it overheats, and so it, yeah, this yeah. little guy overheats. This one, I haven't had issues shooting in 4K with it, it's been fine. Yeah, and so that doesn't this either, it, it manages its temperature really well, and you can shoot for a long time. But there are caps on how long you can shoot a video. In my case, without a grip, I can only go for something like 15 minutes, which is really short. Um, and with the grip, I think I can go up to a half an hour. And I cannot continue beyond that. I have to continue resetting, which is, in some applications, not the best thing. Yeah, and I honestly don't know the limitations on my camera because, that, again, it's just not how I shoot. I would rather do it in little chunks. I guess the only thing maybe to talk about is are things that both of our cameras have, but they've kind of been half-assed of sorts. <laughs> so part of that is going to be like the flip-out screen. Like I love this little pop-out screen, but I don't like the fact that it's limited to doing this and that it doesn't swivel out. Yeah, because you're kind of losing. Yeah, like you're losing like a vlogging, um, the vlogging audience, or just like even if you're not vlogging, sometimes you just want to be yeah. like in in an instance where like you're filming, you know, yourself, or you're just not behind that camera. You just can't tell, you know, what your frame is. You mm -hmm. can't tell if your camera's recording. And it would just be helpful if it could just flip up and you could just see your LCD yeah, in comes, really flexible ways. Comes a bit short there, yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's a bit of a disappointment, and also touchscreen. Both of our cameras have touch screen, but they're kind of limited in terms of what you can actually do with them, at least on the Sony. I haven't found a, anything that I want to do with touch screen that I cannot do. However, I just don't use touch screen all that much at all. Sometimes it's nice to touch and focus, that's about it. I find the swipe completely useless and altogether it's a gimmick. I, I don't care for this feature too much in particular. Oh, come on. The touch to focus is, is, is a good feature to have. So I like that a lot. And that is, is actually one of the reasons why I went away from using adapted lenses because when I was using my lens adapter trying to use my Canon lenses on my Sony, it, I was losing that ability to touch to focus. Right, so, so in the end of the day, these cameras are both very, very high quality. They're not extraordinarily or outrageously expensive, to be honest. Um, this one sells for a bit under two thousand dollars. Mine is more. It's close to three thousand. But again, if it you want, cool if you want an actual like the um, the better model that's more on par with the XH one is going to be the A7 III. Right, and which would be in yeah. the twenties megapixels somewhere, right? Right. So that's the main difference is that the A7 III has the, basically half the megapixels of the A7 R3. So if you don't need right. the megapixels, which you know, in all honesty, most people probably don't. Yes. Yeah, so the A7 III, I think, is about two thousand. Right. So, yeah, and yours is 3000, but it's full frame. And I have seen the full frame and the pixel shift make a dramatic difference in the quality of your photography since you got it. So I think it's actually working out really well for you if you do have more megapixels. Yeah. Meanwhile, I myself, I don't care to have that many megapixels. and actually really dislike having storage issues, <laughs> which arise very quickly out of buying this camera. So um, if I had to handle the volumes and sizes of photos that you do, I would be really frustrated. I, I'm pretty happy. Fuji film keeps my megapixels somewhere in the 20s and I think even after they release the X-T3 they're likely to keep it that way despite putting in a full frame. Yeah, I mean if you look at most of the cameras on the market, like there's very few, like even on the Canon DSLR side there's a 5DS which I think does what 50 megapixels, but that's again a specialty camera. Yeah. Most people, and I have actually been totally fine in my 6-7 years of doing photography full time with my 5D Mark III, which yeah. has, what, 24 megapixels. That is true, but now you're That's moving fine. more into architecture and landscape, and both actually really benefit from the megapixels. Yeah, I remember, I think with Sony, it comes down to they've advanced a lot more. It helps me do my job better with the autofocus and the eye autofocus, and just like it's it's a lot faster than my DSLRs, and just the flexibility of being able to shoot with an EVF whenever that works in my favor. Sometimes it doesn't.
and also just being able to shoot with my LCD. Like the fact that I can compose with an LCD now and not have to constantly, you know, hold my camera up to my face to compose has just been, for me, that's been the biggest game changer, I think. It's quite interesting because at first, when you come from a DSLR, you're very much into looking through the viewfinder. Yeah. However, after you get over that habit, you start realizing that composing with LCD gives you many more shots. It does, like yeah. it, it could be, I can stretch out my arms, I can tilt the screen down, and then I'm able to shoot a shot that I never was able to with the DSLR. So, in fact, they're more versatile, these mirrorless cameras, than the DSLRs. I think so too, because you know, I have live view on the DSLR, but if you've used the live view on the 5D Mark III, you know it's pretty slow, it's clunky. It's it's just not as fast as when you're using it like on the Sony. So yeah, like you're right. Like I can just I can compose more interesting and unique shots because of that LCD that I just can't do yeah. with the DSLR. So yeah. that for me has been I think now that I'm thinking about it like the biggest reason why I love the Sony <laughs> so much. Yeah, and I found myself much more creatively empowered since I switched to Fujifilm. I mean, I love it and. I actually am a fervent um, buyer of Fujifilm and I will not switch for a long time. There's something really big needs to happen to make me switch. I can't say the same with Sony. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that I buy the Mark IV. I may wait for Canon to see what they do. So I'm kind of up in the air. We'll and, and you're the professional shooter, so you actually have four cameras to fit many different situations. Too many cameras. <laughs> That's right. So what I'm doing is not necessarily what I recommend other people to do because it's expensive, but yeah, yeah, so right now I have two Canons and two Sonys, so... And how many lenses? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> um, yeah, but, okay, I mean, that's a whole other topic, but one of the reasons why, though, that I can't switch fully to Sony is I literally can't afford it. Like, even if I were to sell all of my Canon gear, because I bought so many of it used, or, you know, the Mark I version, I don't have the most current versions, and I've beat this gear to death, <laughs> it, the value just doesn't translate, so it's, and, and Sony lenses are a lot more expensive, so that's another problem with trying to switch between Canon and Sony, Nikon and Sony, is that Sony is priced a lot more higher. This is a good topic because I, I find the Fujifilm price range very attractive. Um, you get a lot of quality for paying less money, honestly. Um, so. With a few thousand dollars, uh, I have only four lenses, and I bought a size just because um, for a wide angle I could have stuck with Fujifilm and paid less money. But um, I find myself with just a few lenses and a two thousand dollar camera able to do a vast range of high quality photography. So that is another interesting point of like, because of the way that I'm choosing to approach my cameras right now, I have you know like my sixteen thirty five, twenty four seventy, seventy two hundred for Canon, and I haven't sold those yet because again, if you look at what they would sell for, the value is extremely low, and I can't afford to buy the Sony equivalents. So as a result, I'm keeping my Canons whenever I need to use those lenses. But with the Sony though, I've ha I've been buying lenses that I wouldn't have normally bought for my Canon, partially because of the cost, but also partially because they just work really well with this camera. So I can use a 24 to 70 f4, which I never would have thought I'd ever use that on a Canon, but I can use it just fine on my Sony. Yeah, it's and powerful. So, yeah, it's so yeah. You can actually, I think, get pretty creative with the lenses that you choose to use, whether it's because you're restricted or because you know you just want to try something different. And you know what's considered professional gear right now is completely up in the air. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, because a lot of professionals would sneer at the fact that they would have f-stop four. Right. However. Um, I buy the lenses that are smaller and actually aren't all the way to 2 or 2.8 because they're much smaller and I'm interested in, in compact because mm -hmm. the way I shoot is a lot of street, a lot of travel, a lot of landscape out in nature. I, the bulk actually slows me down and it limits what I can do creatively. So I choose a lens which may let in less light and so on, but it actually empowers me when it comes to motion. Mm -hmm. So, you know. Pick what makes sense for you. We have, and we've picked many things, in fact. But um, don't pick as many as we have. But um, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and you, or you will need some kind of pack mule when you go on photo shoots.